So, now we go to principles of particle detection and their detection techniques. First, a few equations. Sorry about this, but um, I, I have to. So, you all are familiar with this. Uh, e is mc squared, which you can write as a gamma factor times the rest mass. So, gamma is the relativistic factor. It's always greater than 1. And beta is the velocity of a particle with respect to the speed of light. Okay? So some easy, uh, so the units that we always use is electron volts. The electron of it, the volt is the energy that the particle gains when it traverses a potential difference of one volt. But to give you an example of gamma, uh, what the use of gamma is. So suppose a proton has a total energy twice its rest mass. So gamma is two. <coughs> And with this equation, you figure out that it, if it gamma is 2, then it runs at 0.87 of the speed of velocity. All right, so the protons we have here in our backyard, how fast do they go? The tevatron runs at an energy of 99. Well, it's a tevatron, so it's, it's about 1,000. Oh. So it's 900, whatever, GEV, uh, GEV per B. So it's, let's say 1,000 GeV. So that is how much more times the stress mass? What's the rest mass of the proton? A GeV. So it's 1,000 times its rest mass. So what is its speed with respect to the speed of light? So it's 1 minus 1 over 1,000 squared. Simple as that. So it's 0.99999 times the speed of light. Okay? That's how these equations work. And then you can relate the momentum to the energy and the velocity through this way. Now, one more thing is uh, in almost every detector, we want to measure the momentum of a particle. How do you measure the momentum of a particle? We do that with a magnet. So almost every detector that I will show you has a magnet somewhere. And the reason why we have a magnet is because if you put a particle in a magnetic field, the charged particle in a magnetic field, it will experience the Lorentz force. And I'm sure they explained to you what the Lorentz force is when they discussed accelerators. Right? Right? How do we keep these particles in a circle? Yeah? Using, the mag using magnets to uh, alter their course? That's right, so that's the that experience the Lorentz force. So if you have a particle coming in, in a magnetic field, but it's perpendicular, it will be deflected. And how much it will be deflected depends, of course, on the speed of the particle in the magnetic field. Right? So if I know the magnetic field, and I measure the curvature, I can determine the momentum through this force. And it's the same as when you drive a car. All right? The faster you go, the more difficult it is to make a bend. Same here. Right? So the faster you go, the less the curvature is. So, here we go. So if a charged particle goes through a medium, then what it does is just it knocks off electrons from these atoms. So what it does, it ionizes the medium. And then the first question you can ask yourself is, how much energy do I lose per unit length? Okay? Now, I was always told that you guys hate formulas. But here's a formula. It is the average energy per unit length that a particle is expected. <coughs> and I have a reason for that, for uh, why, I, why I wrote down this formula. It's the only one that I will show. And I have a reason for that. I'll come back to that later. So this is the average energy that a particle loses per unit length. It's given by this equation. So let's look at this. There's a constant here. There's the charge of the particle, the incoming particle squared. There's a ratio of Z over A, which is the atomic number over the atomic number, atomic mass. And then it goes as 1 over beta squared. And I told you beta was the velocity of the particle. All right? Then there's a logarithmic dependence and a few correction factors. So you can plot this. And this is what it looks like. So 
this is the average energy loss per unit length, normalized to the density of the medium, times beta gamma, this function of beta gamma. And what you see is very striking. First of all, what you see is there's a very steep dependence for very slow part, which is this 1 over beta squared. That is, if a particle goes very slowly, it loses a lot of energy, which is exactly what you expect, right? It comes to a stop in a very short distance. Then you see it reaches a minimum. When a particle is at this minimum, we call this a minimum ionizing particle. It almost loses no energy. And don't forget this scale is logarithmic. And then there's a very slow rise. The other thing that you see is that this EDX is about the same for all the elements. There's lead, tin, iron, aluminum. It's the same for all the elements, except one, which is hydrogen. Why is that? Why is hydrogen different? formula has z over a. Normally, you know, there are an equal number of neutrons as there are a number of protons. Except for hydrogen. There is no neutron. So that's why hydrogen is about factor 2 pi a. All right. So what we can do is we can measure this. So what I've shown here is the average energy loss per unit length as function of momentum for different particles. And you can see here that we can distinguish the different particles. This is the EDX from muons, for pions, kaons, and protons. Okay? Now what I would expect you to do now is say, I want you to stop me here because um, I would stop because I have just told you here that all these curves lie on top of each other. And here, they spread apart. Am I pulling your leg? Yes? Some of those lines look like they cross. <coughs> yeah, but that's not it. I'm not pulling your leg. But you should realize what is plotted. What is plotted here is beta times gamma. It's just pure the momentum or the speed of the particle. What is shown here is plotted versus momentum. That's the, where the mass of the particle comes in. And that's why you pull them apart and why you can actually distinguish. You use this to identify particles. Now, how many of you have ever gone bowling? Every. What's the purpose of bowling? There is no purpose of bowling. All right. I think the purpose of bowling is if you take a bowling ball, you know, you want to knock over all these pins. So, here's a homework problem that I want to give you for this afternoon. The homework problem I'm giving you for this afternoon Suppose you have a field of bowling balls. You roll this bowling ball and you knock over pins. What I want you to ask yourself is I roll oops, and then knock over a few pins. Now what I do is I'm going to take a bowling ball and it's twice as heavy. How many bowling pins am I going to knock over? Twice as many? No. Okay. Do you want to I'm rolling the bowling ball. And now I'm going to roll the bowling ball with twice as speed. How many bowling pins am I going to roll? Twice as